Welcome to the Nature Journal Connection. I'm your host, John Muir Laws, and today we're going to be exploring the critical skill of curiosity. That's right, curiosity is a skill. It's not a trait, something that some people have and some people don't. It's a skill that you can practice and you can get better and better and better at it. In addition to that, it's critically important. When you're curious, you think better. Your brain works better when you're curious about something. You get a slosh of this neurotransmitter called dopamine. And when that's in your brain, your ability to focus, your ability to concentrate, your ability to remember goes way up. So your brain works better when you're curious. In addition to that, when you're curious about something, that, that feeling can pull you in to a deeper connection with whatever you're looking at. And when you're doing that, you're going to notice things you otherwise wouldn't have seen. You're going to be able to stick with something long enough for the mysteries that are in front of you to start to unfold. When you first start looking at something, you'll see the first level of, of wonders and mysteries. But if you stick with it, you'll begin to peel back the layers. The really interesting questions are not the first ones that you're going to come up with, but they're hidden several layers deep, just like an onion. And you have to go through those first layers of wondering and questions in order to unpack it and to start to get to the really, really cool stuff underneath. In addition to this, if you understand questions and their structure, you'll know exactly what to do with questions when you get them and how to investigate them by your own direct observations in the field. Let's take a look at an example of this from some observations I made yesterday and late last night. My investigation started on a fall afternoon in Northern California. As I looked down a hot asphalt driveway, I discovered a little ring of seeds on the ground. I got down on my hands and knees to take a closer look, and when I did, I discovered that this was the entrance to an ant nest. In a small crack in the asphalt, I could see two kinds of ants moving in and out. There were small ants with small heads and there were small ants with really, really big heads. So that was cool, two different shapes of ants. I got out my journal and started to document what I saw. I began just by describing the ants. I drew pictures of those two forms, trying as accurately as I could to show the size and the proportions of that really, really big head on the big head ant. And then I started drawing a picture of the entrance to the nest with all the little seeds circling it in a ring. And as I did, an interesting question occurred to me. I could see ants moving seeds in and out of the little crack in the asphalt, but nowhere could I see any other ants bringing more seeds to the nest. So they're bringing them in and out, but nobody's out collecting more seeds. So the question then is, when are the ants going out and getting more material? Well, what's cool about this is that this is a question I can answer from my own observations. All I needed to do was just show up a little bit later that afternoon. When I did, no ants. And then at sunset, no ants. And then I returned at nine o'clock at night and what did I find? But a long trail of ants issuing out of the crack and up into the grasses and the hillside nearby, ants going back and forth carrying seeds and materials. So what I've been able to do here is really pretty exciting. I was wondering when do the ants collect their seeds? And from my own direct observations, I've been able to partially answer that question. I now know they collect them at night. Unfortunately, I've missed the point when they emerged from underground to begin this foraging. But I could answer that by 
hanging out with this ant nest on another evening. In addition to that, I can stay up a little bit later and perhaps find out when the ants go to bed. So that's what I did. At one o'clock, I returned and this time found even more ants out on the trail. And as I looked closely, I discovered that they were actually moving in both directions on the trail carrying seeds. So carrying seeds to and from the nest, small insects as well. My plan was to show up at three, four, and five o'clock that night. Unfortunately, once I fell asleep, there was no getting me up. At six o'clock the next morning, I realized I had missed some of those observations, so jumped out of bed, ran over to the anthill to discover that all the activity had stopped. So somewhere between one o'clock and six o'clock, those ants had gone to bed. That's my investigation for another night. Behind this first set of questions and observations are even more interesting questions. I now know they come out at night. The next question I ask is why? Why do they come out at night? Another interesting question is what are they doing moving back and forth on that trail carrying seeds and insects? I could see them bringing material to the nests and maybe throwing some trash out around the outside edge of their nest, but why, why were they so far away from their nest carrying material along the trail? There are all sorts of aspects of ant behavior that I don't yet know or understand. And that's really exciting to me as a scientist. Every open question is a doorway to another investigation. There are three categories of questions that you can ask in your nature journal. The first we call, let's see. A let's see question is a question that can be answered by direct observation. If you're wondering, what time do the ants come out and begin to forage? You can sit there and watch the ant nest or come out and visit at various times during the day, and you'll begin to put that picture together. So that's a question that you can directly answer from your own observations. But there are other questions that you cannot directly observe. So if you're wondering when the ants come out, that's a let's see question. If you're asking why the ants come out then, you can't directly observe why. And this leads us to the second category, what we call the could it be questions. I can say, well, it could be, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. It could be that they don't like to come out during the daytime because it's too hot. Perhaps they come out, don't like to come out then because it's too dry. Perhaps they don't like to come out during the daytime because they'll be easier, more easily seen by predators. Or perhaps they don't like to come out during the daytime because something else that I just haven't thought of yet. And so what I want to do is to write all those possibilities down. So if I've got a, a could it be question, like a why question, then I want to start playing with that by writing down possible, possible reasons why. Right? And, and I, I'm not saying that any one of these is my answer. If you just write down one, what happens is our brains tend to go like, oh, that one must be right. But the minute you're writing down several of them, your brain goes like, okay, look, I know there are different possibilities here. And I always like to include that possibility of something else that I haven't thought of yet. So I'll draw another little arrow to a question mark just to remind me that there are other things out there that I haven't thought of yet. The final category of questions, we call these the let it be questions. And these are questions that just in the realm of science, we really can't say anything about it because there's no evidence. We don't have any evidence that we're looking at. So if I'm wondering about, you know, how does the tree feel about the bird? I don't have any way of collecting data of collecting evidence on that. And so as far as science is concerned, I, I don't, I can't come up with an answer. Now, these often can be really interesting philosophical questions. Um, and through, through philosophy or um, for, through poetry, these are, are wonderful things to explore. But just, I want to be aware that when I'm, I'm playing with a let it be question, that this is just outside of the realm of science. And that's okay. They're important questions to ask, and they're fun questions to ask. But just as a scientist, I can't directly observe, so it's not 
It's not a let's see question. I can't, I can't, you know, time it and find out how long that takes. Mm -mm. I don't have a tree feeling a meter. I also can't use inference. I can't say, well, could it be this, 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 and be able to explore those possibilities scientifically. I might be able to come up with possibilities about how the tree feels about the bird, but there's no way that I'm going to be able to test that. So those are just in a third category. We call those the let it be. And they're important questions to ask. They're beautiful questions to ask, but they're just outside of the realm of science. And this helps us keep, when we're out exploring in our journal, journals, we can still play with those, 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 those feelings and those emotions, record our thoughts in our journals, but we're clear when we're doing science and when we're not. That's a really important distinction for us to have. Some of these questions may pull you into a chain of making specific observations in order to answer a question that you have. And if that happens, follow that chain. So you were making observations, you came up with a question, you go, huh, well, in order to answer that question, I would need to be able to, to, to notice this and this and this. So that's, again, those are the let's see questions. If you come up with a let's see question, you can answer it on the spot by making more observations, do that. You've just come up with a question and answered your own question by your own direct observations. That's huge. But in order to be able to do that, you be able to, you have to know, I've got to collect questions and be able to go like, oh, that's a let's see question. And I can answer that with my own observations. If you can do it, do it. If you notice that it's a could it be question, one which is going to be involving inference. You can also begin to explore that by coming up with some possible answers. Why is it doing this? Well, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. And you can make a little Y web showing that, well, here's a possible answer, here's a possible answer, here's a possible answer. Both of those are things that you can do in your own nature journal to take a question and move it down the field. If you can directly answer your question from observations, make those observations. If it's an inference question where you're trying to go like, hmm, could it be, then you're going to come up with some possible, plausible could it be's and write those down in your journal. In either case, you've made observations that stimulated you to ask questions. Those questions then stimulated you to take the next step either to answer your own questions from your direct observations or to start to come up with possible explanations. And in both cases, you're training your brain to think like a scientist. As you go on with your nature journaling, this process of asking questions, finding mysteries around you, is a, it's a skill that you will improve and improve and improve till you can go out anywhere and you find really, really interesting stuff. That interesting stuff was there all along, but we just hadn't trained our brains to be able to see it. And that's what we're going to be practicing. That's, that's a really important part of the magic and the power of nature journaling. I hope that you have a lot of fun with this process. For me, this is one of the most exciting aspects of nature journaling. Give it a try and see what happens for you. And until next time, this is your Nature Journal Connection. Do do do.